I now want to talk to you about the sculpture at Chartres. Uh, there's a lot of sculpture at Chartres. We're not going to try to talk about it all. I'm going to be using selected examples, uh, emphasizing uh, the central portal on the west side, and then showing a few examples from uh, the other uh, portals or transept entrances. What we're looking at here are the three portals that are on the west side, uh, the main entrance to Chartres Cathedral. And the, uh, the dates that your book gives you are for the erection of the, the facade. Uh, so these are probably going to be, they're at the bottom. Uh, presumably they're a little closer to the earlier part of this, to about the mid-century. And they're they're very interesting images, so we want to take a look at them and uh, talk about them. You might notice the central tympana is largest. Uh, the two tympana on the side are smaller. The tympana, uh, I think we've talked about this with Roman art, but the tympana is the area in is the area inside the arch. It's above the doorway, and then you have this arch, and then you have the sculpted area within it. Uh, in this case, it's a slightly pointed arch, uh, which we uh, saw at uh, with Gisobertus's uh, Last Judgment at Autun, and uh, of course, even more so now that we have a Gothic cathedral, the the point is a bit more. Uh, what uh, prominent, and we'll get even more so with the later churches. So this is our mid 12th century sculpture, uh, the early Gothic period. Also, I should mention that the churches have door jams, and jams are just the vertical members. Uh, in these cases, they're usually columns. Uh, that are adjacent to the door on either side, and as you can see, they really give it a very three-dimensional uh, uh, appearance because uh, they it's not just a flat door. Uh, it really has dimension and volume with all of these uh, jams that lead up to the door. Uh, generally, the jams are carved, and, uh, and the images that we're going to be looking at, they're carved with figures. And you can see here that the figures are very cylindrical, uh, like the columns on which they are mounted. And uh, that will be one of the points we'll be making as we look at some more examples. Um, in fact, here we are looking at more examples. Uh, one of the features that you will find out if you compare uh, Gothic sculpture with Romanesque sculpture, and thinking of things like uh, Vézelay, uh, Autun, you know, Giselbert is a sculpture, or uh, Gueldinus's. Um, but particularly thinking of that Burgundian sculpture. Um, and then you go and you look at the Gothic sculpture, and it starts, it's starting to become more naturalistic. And that continues all the way through the Gothic. This is just the beginning, so there's still a lot of uh, transitional features. You know, this is not fully developed. This is just the very beginning, just the start of the Gothic. Um, and then uh, as time progresses, uh, say in the 13th century, you get these very elegant Gothic Madonnas um, and other saints and other figures. Uh, and eventually, even uh, in Germany, you get uh, extremely emotional and exaggerated forms, uh, which are just these these wonderfully emotive, they call them Andachsbilder, uh, pictures to meditate on. And uh, I'm supposed to elicit very, very strong emotion and devotion, or devotional images. Um, this isn't that. <laughs> I'm just sort of mentioning the future because uh, we have limited time. Um, what we're looking at right now is the very beginning of the Gothic period. And so there's just a few things that look a bit more naturalistic. Obviously, uh, these sculptures are still 
uh, dependent, subservient to the architecture, if you will. They're shaped like the shape of the architecture, and that's a Romanesque characteristic. But there's a few things that say, wait, we're changing. We're becoming more naturalistic. If you look at the face, uh, look at some of the details of the faces, and you'll notice things like cheekbones. And although the hair are, is parallel grooves, uh, it seems to be less uh, fanciful decoration with little curly cues and uh, perhaps a, a bit more uh, realistic imagery there. Uh, the, the way the faces are modeled uh, give you a greater feeling of realism. And even when you're looking at the drapery folds, uh, which obviously some of them seem to be uh, you know, just wrapping these very, very thin figures, or uh, our, our lovely lady there has these uh, uh, vertical image that just really, at the vertical grooves that just really re enhance the feeling of this tall, thin uh, figure. But take a look at the shoulder of this particular figure that I've got the detail of. Um, there's a place where the drapery seems to bunch together and then come out. And that's even more prominent here if you look at this king and that's what, uh, well, I'll get the icon art view in a minute, but if you look at the garment that he's wearing, of course it has all of that decoration, but you might notice that it's kind of bunched and then it comes out uh, it hangs, I want to say. Of course, it's stone, but that's the appearance. As though it's hanging. So the, the drapery folds are becoming more natural. Um, they're not there yet, but it's a step in that direction. And I think you can take a look at this face and see also that this is more realistic than, say, the face of Christ at uh, Tan or, or Burgundy. Now, the iconography of this has... Uh, you know, people have said different things over the years. It used to be thought, uh, they used to say they saw the crowns on some of these figures' heads and they thought, oh, maybe these are, you know, uh, kings and queens of France. Uh, but I think most people are agreed that these are Old Testament figures, uh, including the kings and queens of the Old Testament. And uh, you have people, of course, like David, Solomon, who would be wearing uh, crowns and uh, uh, they may very well be the ancestors of Christ. Uh, Christ was supposed to descend from David. Uh, and so you know, this is sort of the, the Old Testament um, predecessors of Christ, who of course is up in the temple above, uh, connecting the Old Testament and uh, the New. And then, as we enter, we look up at... Uh, this tympana uh, with all of the archivolts and uh, the carvings above. The archivolts are those, uh, I, I want to point at things, and it's very frustrating because when I'm teaching in class, I just point. <laughs> um, you can see that in the arch, there are, of course, stones that are carved with individual figures that form sort of a half circle. Of course, there's a pointed circle, but half oval uh, around the tympana. And those blocks are called either archivolts or voussois. It's the other name they use. Uh, no, I'm not going to test you on that term. Um, but anyway, we're looking up here. And of course, just like in the Romanesque churches, uh, you see, and it'll be very naturally as a Christian church, Christ is the most important, the largest figure. He's right in the center. And beside him, or something you've, you've seen many times before, uh, the symbols of the four evangelists. Uh, the angel or winged man of St. Matthew. Uh, below that is the lion, the winged lion of St. Mark. And then you have the eagle of uh, John and the winged ox uh, that stands for St. Luke. And you'll remember that we said that these come from the visions of God on his throne, the vision of Ezekiel, uh, the vision of St. John the Evangelist uh, when he was exiled to the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation, 
or the apocalypse. Uh, he has a vision of God and the four living creatures surround the throne of God and they sing Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. So, well, if you're reading the Latin Vulgate, they sing that. Uh, it would translate as holy, holy, holy. Uh, so Christ is identified here as, as uh, God and uh, the side of the Trinity where uh, he shares the substance of the Father. So uh, what you are seeing is a heavenly Christ, uh, the image that we've seen many, many times before, the Maestas Domini, the majesty of the Lord, or Christ in majesty, Christ in glory. And in this case, and I'll explain to you why it very well may be uh, not just we're looking up there, but it's it's also been called the apocalyptic Christ and the second coming. Okay, what what's that all about? Well, the apocalyptic Christ, uh, if you look at those figures in the archivolts, uh and you think back to Mwazak, we had the same kind of iconography, actually, um, where you have the 24 elders of the apocalypse uh, who take their crowns and throw them on the crystal sea. Uh, and so those um, would identify it as Christ of the apocalypse. And the apocalypse, or the book of Revelation, uh, tells the story of the end of the world where all these horrible plagues come and uh, destroy and kill all of mankind. Uh, it, the Last Judgment isn't, isn't part of the book of Revelation, but the idea is that this prepares the way for the Last Judgment eventually. So what we're seeing essentially, the idea that Christ will come again at the end of time, uh, may be part of this. Now, there's the apostles below there. What are they doing? Well, in Matthew, uh, Christ tells his apostles that when he comes again and when he sits in judgment, uh, they will be with him. So there they are uh, with two extras. Um, the two extras are always kind of interesting. Uh, some people think that they might be Enoch and Elijah. Enoch and Elijah are the two humans who did not die. They were taken into heaven. You're probably more familiar with uh, Elijah and his fiery chariot uh, uh, that's taken up into heaven. Uh, well, at the end of time, everyone has to die, including Enoch and Elijah, who've been spending their time, presumably, in heaven. Uh, and so they have to return. Uh, it's also said that these are the two witnesses uh, that are mentioned in the book of Revelation who are sometimes identified with Enoch and Elijah in uh, exegesis or commentary. So, yeah, there's a lot of names we could give this. <laughs> and here we're looking closer. And I wanted to point out some things about this. We said that with the Gothic sculpture, you're seeing an image that's much more naturalistic. And I think you can really see that uh, with the image of Christ. One of the things that's fairly obvious is that the proportions are normal. Think about Vesele. Think about uh, a ton and how the knees were splayed. Uh, at, at Vesele, this twisted to one side. At a tongue, uh, you've got sort of this bow-legged Christ. That everything seems to be flattened because they're using a you know, flatter block. And this artist is using a thicker block. And the knees project forward. Instead of some tubular person who uh, can twist and writhe into different parts of the... Uh, uh, architecture, we see pretty normal proportions. I mean, you know, Christ looks like he's normally proportioned like another human being rather than having long, long skinny legs or arms or torso or something. Uh, so we've got normal proportions. The knees and the arms actually project outward uh, you know, into our space, into real physical space. And then take a look at those drapery folds. Uh, they seem to very tightly wrap the knee and bunch up. And so, although there's still certainly some uh, love of pattern here, we're starting to see more naturalistic drapery. Now, there's one place where that, that uh, uh, pattern just uh, takes hold and you have these sort of swirls over the arm. 
um, which uh, maybe aren't qu the, the raised arm that would be, would have been blessing before it was broken off. Uh, so there, there are some times that uh, the pattern uh, breaks through, but you can see, a, I think, a lot more elements that are saying uh, that this is looking more real, essentially. There, said it. Greater, natural, greater naturalism than the Romanesque. Uh, the knees and arms project outward, and the drapery folds, for the most part, uh, follow the body. And we also mentioned uh, the fact that we have normal proportions here and a structured face that seems to have uh, bones behind it. The, the cheekbones are prominent. Uh, the the uh, face is really articulated. And so here you see it. Um, this is also kind of interesting, too, because Christ, he's coming at the end, but he doesn't seem to be a wrathful Christ. Uh, he seems to be very, very human. And so you see this emphasis really on the humanity of Christ during the Gothic period. Um, a Christ who lived as a man, who suffered as a man. Um, and one of the things about that I think is so interesting, I think by this time you know it's really, really ingrained that Christ is divine. And you think of those great uh, majesties of the Lord in the Roman as Tempina and, and how it perhaps you know overwhelming and uh, just amazing they seem. And here the pendulum swinging the other way is, okay, we all know he's divine. Let's remind us that he actually took on human flesh and that was the first sacrifice. He suffered horribly when he died. This was a sacrifice that saved mankind. And so now we're seeing that emphasis on uh, uh, being able to identify with the human Christ. Uh, people would weep over the sorrows of Christ. Um, and they would imagine themselves walking with Christ. I um, might also point out, uh, once again, those drapery folds that uh, around the neck, they seem to uh, sort of bunch up and then fall more naturally. The, the face is really contoured. Uh, the wave of the hair, although you do have these parallel lines that certainly are pattern-like, uh, you, you don't have these sort of wild curly cues. It, it, it's starting to look much more like hair. Now, we're looking uh, to the right of the central uh, tempana. Um, and we're seeing what is sometimes called the infancy or the incarnation tempana. And what we see at the top is the virgin and child enthroned. Uh, we've uh, seen this in, in uh, the Roman escort, the idea of the throne of wisdom, the Sedus Sapientia, uh, that Mary holding the Christ child on her lap can be identified with the throne of wisdom. Christ himself is holy wisdom and she's sort of um, containing him. Uh, it's where he sits. She is the throne. He is the wisdom. Um, there's another interpretation, too, when you see uh, Mary holding the Christ child, and, and we'll need to refer to this as well. Uh, Mary is also known, she has many, many uh, titles. Uh, one of them is the altar of God, or the altar of heaven, the Ara Dei, or the Ara Kole. And so Christ becomes the Eucharistic bread on the altar of her lap, as it were. Then we're going to look down below. We're seeing infancy scenes. Uh, the uh, right below uh, the seated Madonna and child flanked by angels. Right below that, you'll see what looks like a little altar and a uh, very badly damaged uh, figure of the Christ child standing on it, uh, with uh, Simeon and Anna, and of course Mary and Joseph are in that crowd somewhere and a few extra figures, I guess, just to fill it out. Uh, but this is the presentation of Christ in the temple. Uh, and it's uh, when uh, uh, Simon, who had, who, it's, well, there's the catechol of the Nunc nic, nic, nic Dimitas. Um, Simeon is a very old man. Uh, God has, he, 
given him a vision and promised him that he would see the Savior of the world before he died. And they bring in the Christ child and he recognizes it and he said, uh, Now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy will. There is, now I have seen the Savior. And so he's being recognized even as a child uh, in his divine role. At least that's how the Christians would have interpreted it. Um, down below you have a number of scenes starting with the left there's an annunciation uh, when the angel Gabriel tells Mary that she will bear the Christ child uh, which is of course the moment of the incarnation uh, and then you see two more figures and this is the visitation or Mary and Elizabeth meeting when they are pregnant and John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb uh, acknowledging uh, Christ even in his mother's womb in the center, you have what looks kind of like a table, actually, uh, but it's uh, evidently supposed to be some kind of bed, and Mary is lying on it, having given birth to Christ. And uh, we'll have another image in a minute where you can see it perhaps a little closer. Once again, the Christ child is very badly damaged, but he is lying in his swaddling clothes on top of that canopy over the bed. And then we have this uh, wonderful little scene of the shepherds who are coming uh, to pay homage to the Christ child. Uh, let's see them over on the edge and I'll have a detail of that. So we're looking a little closer here. Uh, you can see the throne of wisdom. Perhaps you can see some of these things a little bit better. I think you can see the uh, presentation. Let's say the Christ child is very very damaged there. And you might notice that vertically, vertically we have a uh, series of images with Christ on top of something that either is an altar, in the case of the presentation, or stands for an altar. Mary as the Ara Dei. Or here, I um, think the, probably the reason they have made this little uh, bed with a canopy that, that looks like a table is the table of the altar and Christ is the Eucharistic bread on the altar. So let's take this and look at it vertically. Uh, we have, you know, at the very bottom we have Christ newborn. Uh, he is seated on what appears to be a, a table-like structure. It's a substitute. It's, a, it's Mary's bed, but it's um, it works as a kind of visual altar. Uh, Christ wrapped in his swaddling clothes, which is you know very hard to see because there's uh, just a, a little bit of the, the sculpture left, is lying there uh, like the bread would lie on the altar uh, during the mass. And up above, you see him standing on an altar, being recognized, uh, and then. Up above, we see him in heaven, as it were, uh, as uh, the Eucharistic bread uh, and wine uh, on the host, the sacrificial victim, on the altar of heaven, which is actually his mother's lap. So all of these are referring to the real presence of Christ in the sacrament, the fact that the uh, bread and the wine of the communion service are actually the body and blood of Christ. And of course, um, this was growing ever since the Eucharistic uh, controversies of the uh, ninth century of the Carolingian period, uh, where um, Radbertus was advocating a, a much more physical understanding of the Eucharist and that triumph and of course eventually in the 13th century uh, you have the mass of the Corpus Christi uh, written by St. Thomas Aquinas uh, and of course the veneration uh, whenever you take mass uh, the priest uh, puts the bread in your ma mouth and uh, says uh, body of Christ Corpus Christi Here's the detail. You can see uh, some of these figures a little bit more easily. Let's get closer to them. And some of the detail, too. Uh, like on the bed, the wonderful little arches uh, that, that decorate the, uh, the bottom of the bed. And here's this uh, uh, rather fun, almost like a genre painting. Genre re uh, refers to as uh, 
Uh, we use this a lot in the 17th century. It actually just means type, but it sometimes refers to everyday people doing everyday activities. Well, of course, shepherds would have been uh, an everyday activity in uh, medieval Europe. Uh, sheep and herding was uh, very important uh, for the economy, but, uh, for the wool industry. But uh, so you have them dressed in probably pretty much contemporary clothes. Um, on the north or the left uh, tympana at uh, Chartres, remember there are three of them, uh, we also see another image, and this is the Ascension. Uh, here it's pretty clear that it is the Ascension. Uh, you have uh, angels uh, flanking Christ and this uh, structure that uh, is uh, supposed to be clouds that uh, seems to be uh, almost like a little uh, lift to carry him up into heaven. Uh, then the next level down, you have the angels looking down at the apostles. Uh, some of them are pointing up to Christ, pointing to the apostles, pointing to Christ. Uh, and the, the uh, apostles are standing around below, and many of them are looking upward. And of course, you remember the words of the, uh, the, the uh, men in white, the two angels, who say, uh, Men of Galilee, why are you looking up to heaven at, at uh, Christ? Uh, don't you know that he will come again as he went? And that got to be, that line is very important for the iconography of both the ascension and the second coming. And it also accounts for sometimes our confusion about uh, which is which. Because Christ comes again as he went. So they will sometimes share some iconography and uh, uh, look similar. Now, when you think about it, how does this all go together? Well, we see in the Incarnation Tempana Christ entering the world. We see that uh, you know Christ has come into the world uh, uh, as the Savior. So he's, he's coming, as it were. Uh, the Ascension uh, Tempana is when he's finished his mission on Earth and he's going. He's leaving the world. And then, if I'm right about this, I mean, we do certainly see the apocalyptic Christ and Christ in glory. Uh, is it a reference to him returning again at the end of time? We've now moved to the north portal uh, on one of the transepts. And we're going to look at the central tympana here. And what you're seeing is the coronation of the Virgin. And I'll talk about the iconography in a minute. But first I want to point out that here we are in the early 13th century, and the style has become even more naturalistic. Uh, the draperies really now look like draperies. Uh, they bunch. They have uh, different widths. Uh, they fall. They, they really show you where the knees are. They show you where the parts of the body is. Uh, you can sort of feel that there's a body there. Uh, the proportions are quite natural. Uh, we're looking straight on at it, and we would have been looking at it from below. So if the torso looks a little long, I think that probably would have been corrected by the uh, angle that you would normally see this. Uh, people didn't get up on scaffolds and take photographs straight on, uh, not the, during the Middle Ages anyway. Um, so that's one of the main points that I want to make about uh, Gothic sculpture. Uh, that uh, we do see greater illusionism. There's different ways of interpreting it. Some Gothic Madonnas, for example, are very elegant. Uh, in uh, the late Gothic in German, Germany, we see uh, exaggeration of the suffering and the sorrow of, of uh, Mary and Christ. Um, but all of these essentially are, are emphasizing uh, you know, Christ's humanity, the fact that he actually did incarnate and that people can relate to it. And so he, I think the idea, I think I said this before, that it was completely understood that Christ was divine. And now, uh, since they're uh, emphasizing the humanity, uh, and this shows up in the art. Um, the coronation of the Virgin is a subject that becomes very, very popular during the Gothic period when Mary, the devotion to Mary is just uh, very, very pronounced. Um, Mary is 
uh, sometimes conceived of as this elegant court lady, uh, only very approachable, which a human court lady would not be. Uh, and she's extremely uh, tender-hearted. Uh, she wants to help sinners out. Uh, when it comes to the last judgment, she will plead for uh, the salvation of the sinners. Uh, there's a lot of stories uh, about the juggler who juggles for her, and you know, she's touched by this uh, humble man's uh, desire to please her, uh, about the thief who repents, uh, and even about uh, the man who sells his soul to the devil, and Mary gets the contract back. Uh, so, you know, she's a good woman to have on your side, <laughs> and she's got a special in with God because according to Christian theology she is the mother of God uh, so at the last judgment she's always up there saying but please save another sinner for me uh, I like to kind of imagine her as uh, you know uh, the um, you know reminding Christ uh, that uh, she nursed him she changed his nappies you know certainly he would change save one more for her and indeed in some images of the last judgment this is not a last judgment but some images of the last judgment you will see Mary burying her breast and what she's saying is I nursed you you know <laughs> couldn't be clearer um, but here we see her getting uh, the reward of becoming the queen of heaven and she is going to she's being crowned down below, uh, we see uh, her, her death. Uh, the Dormition, which the word means sleep, but it's a euphemism for the death of the Virgin. And this type of iconography actually comes right out of Byzantine art. Uh, you see images of the death of the Virgin, excuse me, of the uh, Dormition of the Virgin, in which, just as you see here, Mary is lying on a bed. She's dying. Uh, most of the apostles have arrived. Uh, they're uh, sitting with her, very sorrowful. Um, Thomas, unfortunately, didn't make it back in time. But that's another story. And you can also see one figure in the center uh, that has a nimmed halo, or a halo with a cross in the center. And although he's missing his head, as are a number of the other figures, uh, the cross-shaped halo identifies him as Christ. And in Byzantine art, you basically would see him at the Dormition of the Virgin, standing and holding what almost looks like a little doll, uh, which is the Virgin's soul, uh, a little amorphous form that he's going to take to heaven. Uh, and I presume that the iconography, when, if all the pieces were there, would be uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, this, of course, Christ has already died. He's already uh, gone to heaven. Now he's returning to heaven uh, at the death of his mother to bring her directly to heaven, her soul. The next scene is, is kind of interesting because they call it the Assumption of the Virgin, and it's so different than the Renaissance images that I'm used to seeing, where Mary is uh, being carried up with uh, angels and... Uh, very exciting, but here we have this horizontal format, and what we see is something happening before that. Um, you have these figures that are leaning over and holding the winding cloth, and you might think, well, they're putting her in the tomb, which was what I thought at first glance. Um, but then when I looked a little further, I realized uh, that those arcs behind the figures would have been the remains of the wings, and all of these figures are angels. And what they are doing is they're taking her out of the sarcophagus, as it were, uh, in order to bring her body to heaven. So she will be bodily assumed into heaven, uh, and she, her both soul and body will be uh, united in heaven. And then as we see up above, we see the, uh, the coronation of the Virgin. Um, so this is you know, glorifying the Virgin Mary, in a sense, uh, and emphasizing uh, her importance. Now we're going to look at the North Portal jam statues, or just some of them. Um, what we're looking at is a group of statues that we can actually name. You may remember when we looked at the jam statues on the west facade, we said, gee, are they uh, 
they they used to think they were kings of France, but now we believe that they're Old Testament figures, including the kings and queens of the Old Testament. But we couldn't really say this one is David, this one is Solomon, this is Esther. They were fairly generic. When we look at these early 13th century jam statues, we can identify every one of them. And the reason is because they have what we call attributes or some kind of object that uh, relates to the figure and tells us who they are. Chalices, tablets of the law, the lamb, uh, the crown on David. So let's look at all of those. Uh, the first one on the left is Melchizedek. And remember, Melchizedek was the priest king of Salem who offered bread and wine to Abraham. And there he stands holding a chalice, the wine uh, that refers both to his priest, uh, the fact that he is a priest, and also uh, to the wine that he offered to Abraham. And next we see actually a little narrative scene. Uh, we see Abraham and Isaac, uh, but they're not just standing there, they're actually involved in the story of Abraham and Isaac, the sacrifice of Abraham, uh, the sacrifice of Isaac. And so here is Abraham just about to sacrifice his son, uh, but he's turned his head sharply to look up. And you can see... Uh, his son has followed his lead. He's also looking in that direction. And although we can't see it, presumably what he's doing is looking up to see, uh, to receive the word from, from God uh, that he should stop. He should not sacrifice his son. He has proved his faith in God. Uh, he has proved his obedience to God. Uh, do not sacrifice your son. And uh, so that's it's interesting to have a little narrative as well as the, uh, it's, it serves as his attribute as well. Um, the next figure is Moses. And you can identify Moses because he's holding a tablet of the law. The next one is Samuel, who was a priest, and he is about to sacrifice a lamb. And the final one is King David, who is wearing a crown and holding a scepter. Uh, you know, you could say, well, he could be any 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 uh, king, but because he's uh, next to Samuel, uh, it becomes pretty clear that he's he's Dan uh, he's David, uh, because it was Samuel that anointed David as king. So they have their own individual identities, uh, and we look at them, and they're much more naturalistic. So here we're going to compare. We've got the jam statues from Chartres and uh, somewhere, uh, probably, I put uh, 1150 just as a generic date, but it, it probably was might have even been in the 1140s, you know, 1145, 1147, somewhere there. Um, one reason I want to push it earlier is because uh, it's thought that the sculptor who worked at Saint-Denis in the 1140s, uh, came directly to Chartres and worked on these jams. Um, at any rate, uh, there they are, probably no later than 1150, uh, and they are still somewhat cylindrical, columnar, as it were, uh, related to the architecture of the building, the way Romanesque churches do, but they are starting to have more naturalism in their features and even in a few places in the way the draperies fall. But by the time you get to the early 13th century, not only are the figures individualized, but they are more naturalistic. They are more believable. Uh, the draperies actually look like draperies that are going around the body, not just uh, grooves and ridges that have been carved to approximate dra dra draperies. <laughs> Uh, we see the drapery falling over the arm of uh, Melchizedek and over the arm of uh, Abraham. Uh, we see a mantle that's uh, bunched up around uh, David and around uh, Moses. So we really do have a sense that these are uh, you know, individuals and perhaps uh, 
more believable, more more physical um, than the jam statues that we saw earlier. And of course, this is exactly what the development of the Gothic uh, sculpture is going to be. As you look at other uh, examples of the sculpture at Rams, at Amiens, independent Madonnas, uh, you're going to see. Uh, figures that uh, are much more naturalistic than what we saw with the Romanesque period. And just to finish up with these jam statues, we're moving now to the south portal. I'm not going to try to show you everything, uh, but just another selection. And when you look at this, you may notice they kind of look different. And I think that's an important thing. It's not one artist who's doing this, and sometimes things can actually be done at different times. Um, they've estimated a 15-year span here, based probably on the style of the, the sculpture. Um, but you can see, I think, three different hands at work, or as it's how we often refer to them, three different artists, or three different styles. Um, we have a group that is Balaam, uh, the Queen of Sheba, and Solomon. And I have no idea why Solomon looks like he's pregnant. I think I'm going to make a guess here. Maybe he's just supposed to be rotund because, after all, a king could really afford food, and that would be a mark of wealth. Uh, maybe that's it. I'm guessing. Uh, but uh, we have those three figures with the draperies that uh, you know come, lots of drapery folds. Uh, they look very, very solid. The faces look quite naturalistic, uh, especially Balaam, who really seems to have a character there. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it's just uh, really, uh, you know, even more realistic than what we saw just a few minutes ago. The, uh, the Queen of Sheba actually seems to have a figure. It's going to waste. So uh, does Balaam, for that matter. Solomon has the opposite, I guess. <laughs> uh, he's got a belly. <laughs> then if you look at the other side, uh, St. Theodore is the figure that often attracts a lot of attention. Uh, he's sometimes conceived of as a kind of Christian knight. Uh, and uh, thought to be very individualistic. Um, the other figures, who are all ecclesiastical saints, and I think the, the names are in your textbook, um, but they look like they could be a little earlier, don't they? Uh, they still look a little more columnar, uh, or maybe they're just by a more conservative artist. You know, because you would have, you know, masters and apprentices and journeymen. Um, the, the apprentices wouldn't be carving these. Uh, but you could have people of different ages in the workshop. Uh, not everybody becomes a master. I mean, some people, just like not everybody starts their own business today. Uh, some people continue to work for other businesses for their whole career. Uh, so you might have, uh, say, an older journeyman working at the, uh, under the... Uh, uh, auspices of, of the, the workshops that are working in the uh, creating the sculpture. But it is kind of interesting. You can see different levels of naturalism and uh, different styles, presumably by different artists.